The new Americanized Crown is a lifted sedan with Toyota's latest hybrid tech. It's also the brand's most odd car, and while intriguing, it leaves me with some important questions. If you enjoy fun, detailed car content without fluff, subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. It may seem small, but it's pivotal in helping the channel get more cars to review. With full-size sedans from mainstream brands becoming more of a rare commodity, and the Avalon's recent demise, the Crown carries about a sell me this pen kind of energy. Because if you want a full-size premium car with a trustworthy nameplate, this is about it. But that didn't stop Toyota from getting very excited with the Crown's reveal. It seems that they're really proud of the style, saying that this is the car they think their customers will celebrate their achievements with. Now looks are all based on personal preference, but I think the aesthetics here celebrate short attention spans. The headlights are LED projector on the base XLE trim. If you step up to the Limited or Platinum, you will get quad LEDs. They all have automatic brights, they all have LED DRLs that look cool, including full-length light bars front and rear. But there is a big price difference between them, and that is mainly due to the performance of the top trim, which gets a lot more power and an adaptive suspension. But even here on the XLE, $40,000 is nothing to scoff at, so Toyota still gives you quite a few features. Now, this is a lifted sedan. How much so, you ask? Well, it still has under six inches of ground clearance, so you're not taking this thing off-road, but it does make it a little easier to get in and out of. Step up to the mid-tier limited, and you'll actually have rain-sensing windshield wipers. No matter which model you go with, you have big wheels. Even here with 19-inch rims, the tires themselves actually still have a respectable amount of sidewall. And on the Limited, you can actually get 21-inch wheels, which are standard with the Platinum. For the US, any model with the 21s will also get a 360-view camera, probably to help you not curb it, as seeing out of this swole sedan is not a strong suit. Outside of the US, there are going to be multiple Crown models, including a more traditional sedan and some spicy SUVs. But if you really want to lean into the swanky looks, you can actually get a two-tone paint on the Platinum as well. And if you're trying to find a crown of your own, or any Toyota, may I recommend Royal South Toyota in Bloomington, Indiana. The friendly, community-focused dealership that has let me test drive various new and used vehicles over the years. Check them out and tell them thanks for me. Fortunately, all crowns come with the luxury of proximity unlock and lock. One area where I feel the crown really took a misstep was that it's not a hatchback, which is weird to me because it looks more like a hatchback than a lot of hatchbacks. While easily big enough to accommodate a car reviewer, the cargo space is just average. Maybe a little bit bigger than a Camry, but given the exterior dimensions of this thing, which if you can't tell through the video, it is Big. This could be a lot better. Again, not disappointing. You also have, you know, your battery back here that kind of eats into space. The pass-through is also of an average size, and there's no sort of ski hole or 40-20-40 split. On every single crown, you will have a rear release, which is actually right, right there. And I'm happy to see each model has a spare tire. But really, with this car's exterior size, if they just made it a lift back, it would be much more practical. On the outside, the crown looks like it was tailored for the North American market, but on the inside, its Japanese roots shine through in all of the best ways possible. The build quality in here is good. It seems up to par of even Lexus standards. There are some soft touch materials where you would want them, like where your knees may rest. I kind of wish they continued it a little bit higher on the inboard. And then they used a lot of different textured plastics, which I kind of wish that they threw in metal or some wood or something to really bring things up. But at least it's not just shiny black plastic. It's all stuff that looks like it will age pretty well. It's going to be easy to clean. I also really like the understated aesthetics. Yes, it does lean heavy on screens with a full digital gauge cluster as standard, along with a 12.3 inch multimedia system. But you still have matte finished toggle switches for the HVAC controls that are easy to use. I think the minimalist shifter is nice, and I like the dash design in that it doesn't just look super tacked on, though the dash itself does feel pretty high. The windshield is still large, but the belt line here is definitely raised over something like a Camry, which will be a drawback to some, but 
I like that it's easier to get in and out of again, and it's also more comfortable. The seats sit a little bit higher, and I have better thigh support, and they're also still very soft, and I love the base trims cloth. It almost looks like it's trying to mimic wool that you'll find in like Japanese luxury cars. And then they wrap it with soft text on some of the higher wear points, making something that feels very distinct. They also have standard lumbar adjustment, and it really does make for something that would be a great highway cruiser. And I think it all works with the style very well, especially like the subtle gold trim that you have here on your plastics. This is a big step in the right direction for Toyota. I also find myself appreciating Toyota's new infotainment system and the singular center placed volume knob. It has a very minimalist UI. Response time is good, but still lags behind some of the newest setups. And the voice control works very well, but you're gonna rely on that here more often because it is actually a, a big hassle to change or tune like your radio or whatnot. So I found it easier to literally, even with the windows down, hit the voice button and just tell it to tune to channel whatever. This also has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Another dub for Toyota's tech is the fully digital gauge cluster, which is highly configurable. I wish that it worked better with like navigation and such. While it does lack amazing features, there are some nice ones standard, like again, lumbar adjustment, but also heated front seats, the digital dash, a wireless charger, which actually doesn't work on most new iPhones because the camera bump is too big. It'll have the cool Lexus center console thing, dual zone automatic climate control. Step up to the limited, you'll be adorned with a leather upholstery, ventilated seats up front, heated seats in the back, a panoramic sunroof, and a heated steering wheel. You'll also get an 11 speaker JBL sound system with a subwoofer, but I've heard middling things on that. The six speaker setup is okay, so I wouldn't make that a reason to upgrade on its own. And no matter which one you go with, storage in here is good. I like that you have some big door cubbies, configurable cup holder here up front. But outside of that, it's not super practical. When it comes to your space though, I at six foot three, I find myself with plenty. This center console here doesn't protrude out as much as some other Toyota products, which is great. Even with me in a comfortable yet not super excessive position up front, I have plenty of knee room and thigh support here is pretty good too. These seats are comfortable. All of them will have two charging ports, rear console vents, soft touch padding where your elbow will rest. This would be a very comfortable place for most people. The headroom is definitely tight from that roof line. Overall, I would have no complaints if I had to spend an extended period of time back here. Behind the wheel of the Crown, it is reminiscent of many other Toyota hybrids, but there are a few things that make it entirely distinct in both good and bad ways. Here with the XLE, I'm going to have the powertrain you should probably just buy. It is a 2.5 liter inline four paired up with two electric motors. It has 236 net system horsepower. You'll have one drive motor up front and another drive motor around back. There's no drive shaft connecting the front and rear. The all-wheel drive system is more suited to getting you out of snowy situations than off-roading, so keep that in mind. There's not any like off-road modes that are gonna use the brakes to shuffle power side to side. But this does see a new battery chemistry. It's actually still nickel metal hydride. The new part is the bipolar design, which is more compact while providing a higher output. And the electric and gas up front are combined through Toyota's eCVT, which uses another motor to actually change the ratios and works to regen energy into the battery. It is extremely reliable and it is also very responsive. In fact, I may say with this new system, response could be enhanced just a little bit. Another thing that I'm noticing straight away from this 2.5 liter, it's quieter than what you get with the Camry hybrid. Though this now has electronic variable valve timing on the intake cam, it's basically the same reliable engine with port and direct fuel injection as before. I think it's simply quieter because there's a lot more insulation in here. Now you can also go with the Hybrid Max, which will give you a 2.4 liter turbocharged engine out of the new Highlander, tuned differently of course. That is going to make 340 horsepower, 400 pound-feet of torque, and it uses a six-speed automatic. It is a completely different type of hybrid system. It is not geared towards being as efficient as possible, which is why there's a big difference in efficiency, 
but it will make for a more natural driving experience and also a much more potent one. Toyota says that can get itself up to 60 in 5.7 seconds. I'll try a quick acceleration test here with the base. The major takeaway there was that it was incredibly smooth. Toyota also says that they can send more torque to the rear wheels. While power is sent to the rear quicker, that motor is still far less powerful than the front drive unit. The base setup is primarily front wheel drive and the max is full time all wheel. Getting to 60 and 6.9 seconds puts it somewhere around a standard RAV4 hybrid. Getting up to highway speed is a very easy process, and with both the transmission's urgency to get this thing into the right gear ratio and the electric motor's instantaneous torque, this does have great response and good highway passing power. And then again, 41 miles per gallon combined is a huge pulling factor. If you want your time at the throne to be serene, this will do that just fine. Wind and road noise are subtle for Toyota. Here on the base crown, there is no adaptive suspension, and I am driving it over the worst road that I could think of. The giant wheels do a good job of just smoothing out these bumps. It's not an overly plush car. It seems like they're trying to inject some degree of sportiness. Nothing in here is crashing into the cabin, and the smaller imperfections are very well masked. I would still consider it soft and forgiving, but it's not as plush as what you're going to get with a Lexus product, or even something like the Toyota Venza. This is just maybe a notch or two behind that. Throwing this thing on imperfect corners feels pretty in control. Definitely some body roll. You can tell they were not going for full-on luxury cruiser status. So even without adaptive suspension, it can really hold its own on this kind of windy, tight road. And it doesn't get hot and bothered if the pavement's rough either. Now, as you start to bring it up to speed more, you really notice that the steering is a little bit quicker than I was anticipating for this kind of vehicle. Not super well matched with the amount of body roll. Like this thing is a high riding sedan, so there's just more of that there. It makes it feel a little bit less sure of itself as the speed rises. The steering itself is numb as you would expect, but I think it's weighted well. It's not Corolla light, it kind of has some degree of substance to it. If you want a softer vehicle that also responds quickly, I think you'd like the Crown. Oh, kind of aggressively engine brakes. I almost thought something was wrong there. I didn't even have it in the brake mode. The actual brakes are smooth and work without drawing attention to themselves. Sometimes a low point for hybrids. A downside to the styling is again the visibility. I think the windshield here is pretty large. The hood is low, so you get a good view out the front. But the belt line could be lower, and you're reminded of that even more when you try to look out the back. Though I am glad that they have the three-quarter windows there. So visibility here is kind of middle of the road, and at least you have blind spot monitoring as standard. And you'll have adaptive cruise, lane centering, all there as well. And it is a great system. It's Toyota's latest 3.0. For the price tag, I found it to work really well on the highway. While the Crown is all new, I'd predict the reliability to be strong. It's built in Japan, and Toyota's track track record tends to be exceptional. The base powertrain has proven itself to be reliable in all of its respective models outside of a since-resolved wiring harness corrosion issue. The hybrid Max's Turbo 4 is based around the same 2.5 liter and comes without an electronic wastegate, so I have high hopes for that. Hybrid batteries in the past usually last around 12, sometimes 15 years, so keep that in mind as it could cost four grand to replace. Despite it being a new model, I'd still recommend one over a Kia Stinger, VW Arteon, Chrysler 300, or Nissan Maxima if reliability and low running cost are a high concern. Especially when this gets 40 miles per gallon easily. On the road, I think there's a lot of people who will appreciate this because it's a reasonably forgiving SUV. I think some others will appreciate that when compared to SUVs, the handling is a little bit more reactive than what they may be used to. Others, like myself, may become disappointed that it doesn't do either one of those things super well. I enjoy the crown, but hear me out. 
It's physically larger than the Camry, but the back seat and cargo area are of a similar size. It doesn't handle as well, and it doesn't hold a comfort advantage on a bad road. Something like the Venza, outside of a worse cabin design, offers even better ride quality, similar gas mileage, much more versatility, and a lower starting price. This has many positive attributes, unique style, Japanese character on the inside with impressive build quality and numerous standard features. Features. It also has a comfortable cabin, smooth, quiet ride, agile handling for its size, and a great powertrain. I'd recommend this to anyone who wants something more upscale and special than your typical family sedan, but would rather not make the foray into the crossover world. It's cheap to run, easy to live with nature makes it all the more attractive. My main complaint is that if you're going to blend two body styles together, it needs to take the best parts of both with a small compromise. That way you attract fans of either type of vehicle. Instead, we get sedan practicality with mildly sporty SUV road manners. It seems Toyota backed themselves into a niche with the US spec crown. The good news is that this is a competent car, but its limitations leave me wondering if there's a throne it can conquer. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like to help me crack the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the bell for more. And follow me on Patreon for an additional podcast where I'll answer any of your car questions. See you in the next one.